time. Welcome to Look, Look and Look Again. Ah, 1986. In the West, a time of shoulder pads, of neon gods, of capitalism. Stock market will be a car park in five years' time. I'll have made a fortune, and that's what I want. Commercialism, technological marvels, of beauty and the beast, and the threat of nuclear annihilation as West still continued to bicker with the East in displays of who could beat their chest the loudest. Is it possible, I ask you, to capture the pure essence of a nightmare on screen? Not a nightmare scenario in certain sequences, but a nightmare from the very first frame until the very last, where almost every scene exudes darkest fears and dreads that lurk in the blackest recesses of the human mind. A film that in tone resembles that time when we sat bolt upright in our bed, covered in sweat. Can a film really be that disturbing? Can a movie actually be the embodiment of pure nightmare? 1986's Russian film, Pisima, Miortvova, Celaivieka, do forgive the pronunciation, I'm no interpreter, but I do try. Or in the West, we would know it as Letters from a Dead Man or Dead Man's Letters, is, I feel, a strong contender that fits all the above criteria. This is not hyperbole on my part. I stumbled across this when I had a, um, it was a phase I was going through of all things Soviet. I admire Russia, they are brave and a misunderstood country due to Western propaganda some of the time, as no country is without fault. Due to paranoia and demonization, there are many nuggets of uh, cinematic glory that have bypassed Western eyes as our countries still feel a bit twitchy that nations can be seduced by propaganda and by prohibiting such propaganda, it helps us as a nation. I say bollocks to this as most men and women are now too worldly wise these days and far too self-opinionated, which is a good thing in some respects. I love rusky science fiction and their horror strands with such amazing films such as The Amphibian Man that was made in 1962 and The Vision 1967, oh and um, Planet of Burr in 1962 as well, which I urge anyone to view should you get them. Other gems, but more commercially viable, would be the works of Tarkovsky, such as Solaris, but this movie is um, something which, uh, for me, nails the sheer horrors of nuclear Armageddon, which is somewhat ignored now, and my fear is that we would uh, and could overlook the horrors should it ever happen in society, where everything is airbrushed and skirted around, as to not upset the Western snowflake or the white middle-class liberal elite in the media machine which tries to dominate everything. Ah, oh, remember the internet, how it used to be, and look at it now, as the Armani-suited big boys in media have taken over. This is a prime example. It is no wonder why persons are now going to the dark web, however this is no substitute for the golden ages of the internet that I recall from the late 1990s until the mid 2000s, where the responsibility of what we could see was left entirely up to us, not the state. Back to letters from a dead man, such was its impact I contemplated around 45 minutes into the film to switch it off for a moment to reorientate myself and have a little bit of respite. My nerves at this stage were quite shattered. Without exaggeration, for me this has to be one of the most powerful, important, bleak, desperate and truly horrific accounts of survival I have witnessed. 
an endurance test for the people and the characters in the film as much as an endurance test for us, the viewer. After watching this, one sits in silence and actually contemplates what life could be and what life is. Such is the power of this film. Not only are the images left to scar immediately after, but they stay for a long time to come. You are touched by the power of this film. It achieves what very, very few directors have ever pulled off in the cinematic art form. Letters from a Dead Man was directed by Konstantin Lopushansky and produced by Len Film Studios in Russia at a time when the Soviet dream was showing signs of fray, so it's little surprise that this bleak element is encapsulated in the movie and could touch upon its nihilistic streak. Lopushansky had also worked on uh, Tarkovsky's Stalker as a production assistant, and the world in Stalker is similar to that of Letters of a Dead Man, a septic industrial wasteland where everything is pure toxicity. Lopushansky has created a fetid, contaminated landscape, here too where familiar things are twisted, and a remnants of what once was, echoes of a destroyed civilization. It has to be seen to be believed, and this sets the tone for this very important movie. Lupashansky, for fear of the wrath of the uh, Russian censors, I suppose, at the time, ensures that throughout the film it is made prominent to the viewer that this does not happen in Russia. There are no signs featuring the beautiful Cyrillic letters of the Russian alphabet, and where possible Western ephemera is placed, such as beer cans and alcohol, which at the time of the 1980s were difficult to acquire in Russia. The weapons wielded by the post-apocalyptic armies in this film are far from Soviet, and the scene featuring a hovercraft proves that this is more akin to and synonymous with the British rather than anything seen behind the Iron Curtain at the time. Letters from a Dead Man surrounds the experiences of Professor Larson, played by Roland Bykoff, an actor who should be awarded for his facial expressions alone. Larson was a one-time uh, Nobel Prize winner for physics, and his efforts to survive after a nuclear accident, which has resulted in total devastation. He and fellow survivors, who were once curators at a museum, gather in the damp, wet cellars below some succumbing to the effects of nuclear fallout, whilst others try to survive by exchanging items of food for drugs on the black market. The man writes letters to his son Eric in his mind, and it seems these touching moments of exchange are the fundamentals needed for him to carry on with life and realise his existence. In this microcosm of desperation, Professor Larson assists his colleagues as best he can by nursing them with illegal painkillers as their emaciated bodies lay in the damp underground, exuding their last rasps of breath before they die and their bodies are buried in the earth in the cellar. Life and death here exist side by side constantly in sheer and utter claustrophobia. As well as surviving and sustaining some form of equilibrium, Professor Larson also has to battle the ravages of a nuclear winter as he stumbles across a wasteland to clandestine black market meetings where he and the others avoid the hailing bullets of a military regime formed to combat crime in the aftermath. Sequences of a radiation-suited figure battling the harsh elements for his own preservation and that of fellow man seemingly burn into the retina and ends up straight into the brain. One of the things that scare me is uh, those masks that some of the characters wear, those horrible masks synonymous with things like wars, plagues and hazards of humanity, and uh, Lupashansky milks the nightmare ethereal ascetics for all they are worth, as humans in this film become faceless ghosts, lumbering against the environment, which is at its most harshest due to the radioactive contamination caused by the, uh, caused by the fallout. Somewhat poetic, these scenes are, but uh, always haunting. Eventually, in the film, the military demand that all healthy individuals make their way to the bunker, where they will be looked after. 
The others who have radiation sickness are not so fortunate in this nightmare world as they are simply left to die in the contaminated wastelands. Professor Larson says farewell to his colleagues but eventually takes in a group of abandoned children as he stays behind who have been left to fend for themselves. Larson does his best and in a way substitutes the children for his son Eric. He does this um, and he does his best despite the adversity but eventually the spoils of the apocalypse catches up with them all. The movie concludes in what I would describe as one of the saddest and traumatic haunting moments that cinema could ultimately achieve. To sit through letters from a dead man and not be emotionally affected means that you could already be dead or heavily tranquilized. Lopeshansky pushes the human emotional endurance to the zenith of an almost critical point. The scenes in the dank, wet cellars are all filmed through a yellow filter, emphasising the jaundiced sickness and dank claustrophobia that sets the viewer off balance from the very opening moments. There are sparing moments of tenderness between the survivors and interesting philosophical debate, but one is uh, constantly aware of the fate for many. In one sequence, a young man goes completely mad, Lepeshansky demonstrates this with superb editing and artistic close-ups. For example, the way in which the young man smokes a cigarette, edited as though this is the only comfort left for him, reminding us of a shell-shocked victim from the first two wards. It is a head spinner. The smoking here almost reaches frenzy as the act becomes puff after puff and his eyes eventually bulge with fear and trauma, knowing the fate to come. The cigarette acts as a lifeline, the last absolute comfort and the only thing that the man clings to in life's last chapter. The actor, the actor here captures the perfect expression of um, absolute madness without bordering on the hammy or the comic. It is so eerie and wholly discomforting. We then have a sequence where his own grave is dug and finally he shoots himself to release him from his anguish to eternal peace. This is so well orchestrated and arranged in a way that truly makes the hairs on the back of the neck stand up. Such dire extremities litter the duration of the film and these moments are plenty to the point of being constant. The most unsettling element of the film is the emphasis of suffering, and for a change the blame is not on who caused war, but more catastrophe on a scientific and a progressive part, as we learn this devastation is caused by human error rather than human power, or the aggression in our human condition. There is optimism as the professor guides and mentors the group of children, but what will happen to this next generation is unidentified as they are led into the unknown and to an unknown future. The film does not rely on grand special effects nor on a distracting soundtrack as some apocalyptic productions do, and because of this makes the film all too realistic, all too cinema verité. In one sequence, I was really disturbed. It's a sequence where the professor recollects how we were separated from his son in the sheer panic and calamity of impending annihilation. We witness the explosion. What makes this shocking is that Lepushansky intercuts real nuclear test footage, blending into the narrative and visual framework, and our protagonist then searches in vain for his son. The professor eventually walks down a tunnel and the noise of screaming children in absolute pain can be heard. He is told not to enter an area, but in sheer desperation, to see if he can see if his son is there, he enters and what we witnessed is uh, one of the most harrowing, brutal maison scenes. Surgeons run around frantically trying to operate on screaming children, victims from the nuclear blast. The screams of agony are constant on the soundtrack. Lepeshansky then intercuts stomach-churning medical footage of bomb victims, skin hanging off the bone like charred fabric, and faces partially melted in grotesque remnants of what was once a human being. 
I'm unsure whether these were um, effects for the purpose of the movie or whether actual footage has been utilised. Whatever method, this is one hell of a gritty impact. The camera doesn't linger, but these almost subliminal messages of sufferance are presented here and are uh, presented arguably worse than any out-and-out gore-fest that it could be. It seems to shock without trying too hard, and this for me is the winning formula. As the professor realises his son cannot be located in this charnel house, so the screaming on the soundtrack intensifies as he stumbles out the other end. Traumatised and in pure desolation, he presses his hands to his ears and screams in his pain, amalgamating with those in the makeshift surgery. This is truly a broken man, and after this sequence, so is the viewer. If Lopushansky is making a anti-nuclear stance, then he has exceeded in his expectations, surely. What is also a bit disturbing is that the movie was released after the devastating and tragic nuclear accident at Chernobyl, which is a little too close for comfort, and a rather sinister and twisted irony. Whereas films such as um, the United Kingdom's equally punch in the gut nuclear dystopia threads or USA's um, thought-provoking day after blames the uh, Ruskies, this film is uh, kind of blameless as the nuclear Armageddon is not caught up in a tale of retaliation and who is to blame. Humanity itself is to blame here simply because of a scientific blunder and the double-edged sword of progression. We as a civilization are wonderful in the way we progress with our technology and our medicines, but we, but, but we mustn't be arrogant enough or bewildered by our enlightenment that we could, through human error or simple blunder, result in an apocalypse, therefore totally destroying everything we have done. We, I suppose as humanity, may be quite arrogant about our triumphs to the point of creating a monster, pride before a fall springs to mind. Some reviews have misinterpreted the film and have indicated that the film is set after a nuclear war. I beg to differ here. The only availability of this masterpiece of Soviet dystopia can be acquired on a DVD-R format via American websites. There is, as we broadcast this, no Blu-ray edition or legitimate release to a Western audience. And like some of our other treats on Look, Look and Look Again, this is crying out for a Whistle and Bells release. I'm sure it would be if the director had been Tarkovsky. If I could recommend an example of one of the most thought-provoking, devastating and haunting films of the 1980s, then this surely would be it. It is important and it needs to be seen by nearly every human being for the sole purpose of representing what the effects of nuclear war, or in this case, catastrophe, can do. One thing is to ensure you are in the right frame of mind before watching this gruelling snapshot of what is everyone's nightmare, and if it isn't, it should be, if not the nightmare of mankind. Do not expect a happy ending either. You have been warned. Well, I hope I haven't depressed you, dear viewer, as on Look, Look and Look Again, we like to look at the challenging sometimes. So, here's some kittens. Meow, 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 meow. One pack of new Meow Mix contains three of the flavors that cats like best, beef, liver, and chicken. Just serve with milk or water. Meow Mix tastes so good, cats ask for it by name. Meow Mix. There, that's nice. Until next time, be proud of who we are as a species, but realize the faults as well as everything in life has a, uh, has a duality. And uh, for fuck's sake... Don't press that button, Mr. President. Cheerio!
Yeah. <laughs> 